Voters will narrow the field of candidates in Rhode Island's first congressional district in a primary election on September 5th. The field includes two Republicans, Gary Leonard of Jamestown and Terry Flynn of Middletown, who are competing to represent the GOP against a Democrat in the November general election. I'm Ian Donis, political reporter for The Public's Radio, and I'm joined by Providence Journal State House reporter Patrick Anderson at the studios of Rhode Island PBS. We have a series of questions for Flynn and Leonard to help voters learn more about them. First up is Gary Leonard. Thank you for joining us. In about 60 seconds, please tell us why you're running for this open seat in the 1st Congressional District. Ian, I'm running I, because I don't like the direction our country is going right now. I, I don't think Bidenomics is working for working families. And I, and I also believe, and I think most folks would agree, the divisiveness in our country right now is, is unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime and probably yours. As Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided cannot stand. As a 30-year veteran of the United States Marine Corps, uh, I, I understand that the decisions made in Washington, D.C. have consequences on American families. I saw that in the battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm, I'm running to move beyond partisan politics, which is driven on both sides. Uh, I, I am running to put principle above politics, and, I, and I'm certainly running because I want to continue serving my country like I did for my 30 years in the Marine Corps. Before we go to Patrick Anderson, Mr. Leonard, you recently held a news conference in which you criticized Democrat Aaron Regenberg for accepting an endorsement from Jane Fonda. You called that an ins insult to the military community and veterans. I wonder, was it also an insult to veterans and the military community when Donald Trump called John McCain a loser and said he was a war hero only, before, only because he was captured during the Vietnam War? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't agree with the comments about John McCain was a hero, and, and, and I've read quite a bit about what happened in, the, in, in Hanoi pr prison. I, I, I made that public uh, statement uh, because of her actions in, in, in North Vietnam. Uh, and, and one thing that was disconcerting to me when she was there, she was handed a bunch of letters to prisoners, I think you know the, the history, whose families were back home in America not knowing if their son or daughter was alive. Um, and she proceeded to turn those letters over to the North Vietnam government. Uh, those, those letters never made it home to the families. Uh, to me, that's, that, that's a problem. Gary, the man you're hoping to replace in Congress, David Cicilline, was an impeachment manager in the Trump impeachment. If you were in Congress at the time, how would you have voted on that impeachment and why? Well, I, I think on the impeachment hearing, I, I do think everything needs to be fair and, bal fair and balanced, uh, and we need to be transparent. And, and what I did not agree with the process is that the minority party at the time, the Republicans, had nominated some folks to sit on that committee that, that were not chosen by the speaker. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think that was fair. And I think that process, I, tr traditionally down in Washington, we honor uh, the desires of both parties when we have a, uh, an event like that. So you would have voted no for that reason? Uh, voted no for? Against the impeach, not to impeach. Uh, yet yeah, it wasn't fair. Yes, I would have voted no. More than 130 House Republicans voted against certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election. Were they wrong to vote in that way? Uh, <clears throat> Ian, could you repeat the question? Yes. I'm sorry. More than 130 Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives voted against certifying the results of the, pres the presidential election in 2020. The question is whether it was a mistake to vote against certifying those results. L listen, I, 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 Joe Biden is our duly elected president. In that process, the, is it President Trump's attorney general said the same thing. Uh, Vice President Pence said the same thing. Um, so, so as a 30-year veteran, uh, I, I did not vote during my time in uniform for presidency. I did not believe I ought to be voting for my commander in chief, uh, whether it's a Republican or Democrat. Um, I, I, I opted not to do that. So, moving on to taxes, uh, the Trump tax cuts are set to expire in 2025. And uh, President Biden has proposed uh, extending most of them, but not the cuts for Americans making over 400000 a year. If you were in Congress, would you look to extend all of those tax cuts, or do you think that we can let those tax cuts for the wealthiest expire? 
Well, one, I, one, I do believe we tax too much uh, at the federal and, and the state level. Um, I, I, I'd look into that a little bit more. I, I, I do think we ought to be focused as a country on working families uh, in the middle class and empowering the middle class and lifting the middle class up. So I, I, I'm in favor of anything that helps the middle class, quite frankly, and helps us bring jobs to the country, but to Rhode Island specifically. Would you support raising the eligibility age for Medicare to 67 and for Social Security to 70 and then uh, indexing those entitlements to life expectancy as many House Republicans have supported doing? Ian, I, uh, uh, I recently lost an, my, my uncle. Um, I was the executor of his will after he passed away and he left behind his 85-year-old wife that's trying to raise a 15-year-old grandson. Uh, she recently had to sell her home as a, as a result of where she is financially. She's living off of a social, social security check. She could not pay, pay, pay her mortgage. I am all about protecting promises that were made to American people. I do think um, that we, we can help both Medicaid and Medicare uh, and Social Security by improving our, our economy. And, and right now we're wavering around 2.4%. And I think if we get that number up to 4.55%, we will fix what we see as a crisis in 10 years and push this out 75 years. Just to be clear, is that you're against raising the eligibility age for Medicare and Social Security? I, to, to, to be very clear, you don't break a promise with someone that's, that's eligible to receive that right now. A lot of Republicans in Washington and in Congress have objected to the funding that the Biden administration has provided for the Internal Revenue Service and look, look, looking to claw that back. If you were elected, would you look to defund the tax police? <laughs> um, yeah, li listen, I, I believe our federal government is, is too big, and I think some of the progressive policies implemented by the Biden administration are, are looking to grow that government bigger. We, we don't need to grow our government. We got, we got a, we got a, as, as, uh, as a Republican, quite frankly, personally believe that, that we need less, we need less government. We need a limited government. Uh, so I would not be looking anywhere to increase the size of our government. Would you look to cut a number of IRS agents who, I, who check compliance and I, audits? I, 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 I don't agree that we need to be adding more IRS, IRS agents. We could be putting money uh, to help our customs and Border Patrol folks secure our border down, down, down southwest. President Biden calls support for Ukraine a necessary and vital response to Russian aggression and expansionism. Do you agree? I, 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 I do think the actions we're taking right now in Ukraine uh, are important. I, I, I think everybody, both sides of the aisle, agree that Putin is a thug and, and he's, a, he's, a th he's a threat to peace around the world. Um, that, that said, I, uh, as, as, as a 30-year veteran, I would, I would tell you, you, you don't go into a war without an end in mind. There, near, nearly, there needs to be a clearly defined end state of what we're trying to achieve here uh, or, or an exit strategy for, for in, in layman's terms. I, uh, Lewis Carroll said, if, if, if you don't know where you go, and any road will get you there. And, and, and we absolutely need to have a clear end in mind of what we're trying to do. And there's a few other things I think I'd I'd recommend we do in Ukraine. And the federal government is spending a lot of money to incentivize construction of wind power right here off the Rhode Island coast and elsewhere. Uh, would you scale back those incentives and tax credits for wind power and potentially stop some of these wind farms that are being built off our coast? Uh, Patrick, I've, I've spoken to quite a few voters that, that are going to be affected over in the Middletown up the Sakonet River where they're talking about running a power cable. Uh, and, and I absolutely believe that the, the environmental impact of this needs to be clear uh, to Rhode Island voters of, of what we're bringing on board. Uh, that, th that being said, I, uh, I do think that we as a nation need to look forward in time. Uh, we do need to talk about renewables. I think we all, both sides of the aisle, um, are concerned about the environment. We want clean drinking water. We don't want to see our houses flooded. So, but, but I think we need a, a balanced approach. Uh, to our national energy strategy. Uh, I, I don't think you discount the reliables energy uh, and, and invest completely in the renewables. We need to have a balanced approach on that. 
And I think if we're, if we're serious with ourselves, when you're talking about wind, uh, the wind, our wind farms are only going to work when the wind's blowing. We don't have the capacity right now to store that energy. Uh, that needs to be worked on. We could get some more money into our economy uh, by opening up, quite, quite frankly, some of our other natural resources in our country. And if, and if we're going to be an all of the above strategy, uh, the U.S. Navy has been, been using nuclear power for 65 years without incident. It, it, it's clean. It operates 100% of the time. And I think we can probably get, generate some money to get into second generation nuclear. Thanks. The U.S. Supreme Court has been in the news a lot for examples in which justices have accepted gifts or other financial considerations from individuals with business before the court. If you're elected to Congress, would you support res any restrictions on the ability of justices to accept those kind of considerations? I, I, I would tell you, I, I don't think any politician, bureaucrat, justice should be electing, should be receiving special gifts. I, uh, um, I, I, we do need some reforms down in Washington, D.C. I think uh, Democrat Senator Tester has proposed some ideas right now of preventing politicians when they leave office to move in over to become a lobbyist back to the gov government, uh, to go and become a lobbyist for a foreign country. Um, I, 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 this is a public service. Uh, our, our politicians ought to go to Washington, do their job, and, and come home, almost like Cincinnati did in the Roman Empire, uh, go back to farming. Uh, so so I, I, I'd support some of the things that Senator Tester is speaking about, about certain reforms within our government, and it's particularly from an ethical perspective. Would you support or oppose legislation providing a national right to abortion uh, before fetal viability? I, 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 would, uh, I would tell you, uh, I, you and I both know in 2019, Rhode Island codified its abortion policies into law. I believe the people in the state have, vote, have quite frankly voted in it. And, I, and I'm a firm believer in the 10th Amendment, and I, and I believe those authorities belong to the state. And, and they ought to remain in the state. So there'll be no uh, for a national legislation? I think it's a state issue, and it needs to stay a state issue. With about 45 seconds left, why do you think it's been such a struggle for Republicans to win a larger presence in the Rhode Island legislature? Well, I, I, would, I would tell you, Ian, that I think it would benefit Rhode Island to have a balanced delegation in Washington, D.C. Sure, but why has it been such a struggle for decades? Why has it been a struggle? Um, I was in the, as I was away 30 years, I'm not sure what the struggle's been. I do know Republicans have been elected for this district. Um, so I am focused on 2023, and I'm going to work my tail out, uh, talk to voters, tell voters who I am, what I stand for, what I believe in, and how I will represent them. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in servant leadership. That's what I was taught. I've and that's got what to I stop you to there. I apologize. No, no worries. Our time with Gary Leonard is up. Thank you very much for joining us. Next, we'll hear from Terry Flynn, the other Republican running for an open seat in Rhode Island's first congressional district. We're now joined by Terry Flynn, running as a Republican in the 1st Congressional District. She's a former town councilor in Middletown. We should note that although her husband is named Michael, she and her husband are no relation to Michael Flynn, the controversial former general with roots in Middletown. Thank you for joining us, Terry Flynn. Give us 60 seconds on why you are running for this open congressional seat. Well, thank you for having me, Ian. This is a great public service. And I'm running for Congress because I want to help people, especially those who are struggling. I'm offering voters an alternate candidate to change U.S. politics. And I make decisions listening to people and looking at facts. Uh, four years on uh, experience on a nonpartisan town council. And so I'm not um, beholden to party recommendation or other elected officials. I'm not um, uh, tied to the political system as a, in a typical way. And I uh, will uh, take these approaches to Congress and work with all 435 members of Congress. I, uh, you, people can look me up. I want to tell them on uh, terryflynnforcongress.com. And if the uh, independent or unaffiliated voter uh, thinks I'm their candidate, they do need to ask for the Republican ballot because that's where my name is. 
Your opponent, Gary Leonard, recently staged a news conference in which he criticized Democrat Aaron Regenberg for accepting an endorsement from Jane Fonda. Some people might think there's a little bit of a double standard if he was not also critical at the time of Donald Trump, given how Trump once called John McCain a loser and said McCain was a war hero only because he was captured in Vietnam. What do you say about that? This is media sensationalism, honestly. I think voters are smart and they know that uh, you know the, the large war chests, the, the headlines, the endorsements from people who don't really know Rhode Island uh, candidates uh, are all for name recognition at the polls. And I think voters are also smart and they know that uh, the candidate with the most money or the uh, unknown uh, endorsements, the big name endorsements, may not necessarily be the right person for the job. Terry, the man you're hoping to replace in Congress, David Cicilline, was an impeachment manager in the Donald Trump uh, impeachment. If you were a member of Congress uh, back then, how would you have voted on the impeachment and why? Well, I'm, I think it would come down to facts and law. I'm not sure that I would know the hundreds or thousands of pages of that you know, information to make that decision. And you know, like I said, I make my, my decisions on data, not on party recommendation. Uh, so it would be something that, again, I'm not as familiar with all the facts. I don't think most common people do know all the facts. And uh, so I would vote according to where, uh, you know, the data led me to vote. So did you have, did you have any thoughts of how the president had, uh, had behaved and, and whether he should be impeached or not? Just your gut feeling? Just from what I would read in the newspaper or hear on the news, I wouldn't even, honestly, I, I think a lot of uh, people, no offense to you who are in the news, <laughs> but you have to look at the source and know that we're at the bottom of the food chain for information, the, the, the general public, and, and we're, we're never gonna find out the whole story. So I honestly did not make a judgment. More than 130 members of the U.S. House Republicans voted against certifying the results of the 2020 presidential election. Were they wrong to vote against certifying the election results? It's a similar question because, you know, I wouldn't have all that information. If the information were, and it was done by law, then they were correct. But there's no evidence of widespread fraud in the 2020 election. Members of former President Trump's administration, including his attorney general, say the election, the result of the election was fair and accurate. What do you say? It just sounds like there's a, a he said, she said. Uh, I think there's two sides. I, isn't there still two sides <laughs> still going on? And so, uh, you know, again, I, I'm not going to make a judgment or an opinion uh, because I don't have that binder that has all the information. And again, you know, as bottom of the food chain, I'm only getting the information that, that is coming through the news outlets. It doesn't really make me qualified. Moving on to taxes, the Trump tax cuts are set to expire soon. If elected, would you vote to extend all of the tax cuts or, as uh, President Biden has suggested, extend most of them, but not those for the wealthiest Americans, those making uh, $400,000 a year or more? Well, I think the economy could probably benefit by the tax cuts. And I would really need to see the numbers on that. You know, the, the questions they're asking me to make a judgment with partial information you know, that I would have. These are things that would have to be studied and to look at what the impact would be of, at all levels of income of each tax cut. And so again, I, I think that conceptually, tax cuts are probably good in this current economy. I think it would help bolster the economy. Uh, and uh, but as far as that last part of your question, include those that are the wealthy or not include uh, those that are the wealthiest. I'd have to see the um, the impact of a decision like that before I would want to uh, make a decision. Many Republicans in Congress support raising the eligibility age for Medicare to 67 and for Social Security to 70 and then indexing benefits to life expectancy. If you were elected to Congress, would you support that? 
I would consider it. I don't know if I would support it. Uh, once again, these are things that have to be studied by professionals, the economists, the, you know, um, and how it would impact the, the, you know, the entire society. You're, I realize these issues are complex, but you're they asking are. voters to support you. How can they support you without really knowing where you stand on this kind of issue? I, I think it's fair to ask the voter to understand that, you know, knowledge base is one element, but you can find out information on any issue and research it and, and hire staff or tap into those experts to get the information that you need on a decision. I think what the voter needs to know is that when I'm, making, when I'm in a position to make a decision, that I am going to get that information, I am going to look at the facts, and I'm going to do what's best for the citizens. Slightly, uh, I guess, more basic, but still on taxes. Um, the House Republicans objected to President Biden and Democrats adding additional IRS agents um, and m increasing funding for that agency. If you were in Washington, would you support their efforts to defund those tax police? Well, I have a, a whole philosophy on the U.S. tax code <laughs> and that it should be totally overhauled anyway. Uh, I, I think that if we could make uh, you know, tax policy that would benefit taxpayers nationwide. Uh, a couple of criteria would be to make it simpler and to make it predictable. Th those are you know, two elements of good tax policy. And by simpler, it means that the average taxpayer can understand it. And um, predictable means that the average taxpayer can actually uh, make a plan with it, a financial plan for their financial future. So in my, you know, opinion, I would like to see a, a simpler tax code or at least conversations. And when you make the, the tax code simpler to uh, administer or to apply, then you also re reduce the burden of managing that tax code. And, and so you, then you wouldn't need so many IRS agents. And, you know, again, I think I would use their auditing skills and um, apply them to the agencies and departments of uh, the government to find efficiencies and redundancies, create a revenue stream. President Biden calls support for Ukraine vital and necessary to counter Russian aggression and expansionism. Do you agree? I'll give you an answer, but with explanation. Uh, so I, I do agree. I think that we, we do need to uh, support um, them at this point in time. That being said, you know, I think conflict in general, any out-of-country conflict, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get away from it because we, we don't live in a bubble and we do have extremist leaders that will do unexpected things. And one thing that happens in one country can impact other countries and their citizens. And so, but I think that being said, any out-of-country conflict, again, should have benchmarks. Benchmarks for withdrawal, not necessarily a date, but an achievement. When we achieve this, we can have a planned and strategized departure uh, of, of that you know, situation or that uh, effort. And, and other benchmarks would include financial benchmarks. If we're going to spend X amount of, of dollars, what's the return? If not in dollars, in value, maybe in safety value. And also the return on investment of, of potential uh, bloodshed of our military. Uh, you know, these are all things that have to be weighed and they have to be set out from the beginning, from the outset. And I'd also like to, to thank all of our, our service people, our veterans and our Gold Star families for their service and our quality of life. The administration is investing a lot of money in incentivizing and helping the offshore wind industry uh, build uh, turbines and wind farms, including those right off the Rhode Island shore. Uh, do you support these investments or should we scale back that help for offshore wind and stop some of these wind farms from being built? Well, there's no question that there are some complications with the new energy technology. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, pretty common knowledge that the wind turbine blades, uh, they don't d decay. There's no way to get rid of them. Uh, they, they do chip and so there's debris spread from them. And a lot of the wind turbine projects are being abandoned because the numbers uh, that were negotiated in an economy of a few years ago um, don't work anymore in the current economy. 
And that leaves those who own these wind farms with um, no one to service them and maintain them. So that being said, you know, we, we do have um, greenhouse gas emissions that are warming our oceans. And you know, we need good energy policy that's balanced. Uh, balanced uh, so you know, you're being good stewards to the environment, but not to the detriment of uh, the economy and, and cost of living. So uh, I think right now, uh, the question was, would you continue to invest in, in that um, particular energy resource? I, I don't think that the numbers support it at this point in time. With about 45 seconds left, do you support any restrictions on U.S. Supreme Court justices ex being able to accept gifts or other financial considerations from people with business before the court? That's a very interesting question because I understand that it did come out in the news that there's no uh, there's no one to say that they they can't there's nobody you know no oversight for that group which I found pretty surprising and I I think that they need to uh, they need to have the same rules for investment apply to them as apply to the common investor and uh, you know I I think that that should be looked at and, and put into place because, again, it, it should not be allowed, uh, given their position especially. Our time with Terry Flynn is up. Thank you for joining us. We spoke earlier with her Republican primary opponent, Gary Leonard. The winner of the GOP primary on September 5th will square off in November against the winner of a primary featuring 12 Democrats. For Patrick Anderson, I'm Ian Donis. This has been a special presentation of Rodan PBS, the Providence Journal, and the Publix Radio.